Right, good evening again. I'm uh, Ray Pennicott, the leader of the council. I'm going to start by talking a little bit about the time scales for the proposed HS2. After the consultation ends on the 29th of July, the government is expected to reach a final decision on whether to proceed with the project by the end of the year. I met recently with Philip Hammond and he confirmed that steady's timetable in December. In early 2012, the government will launch new consultation on additional discretionary compensation schemes that will aim to assist homeowners affected by the proposals. And you've heard a little about that. Are the slides gone? Uh, no, there aren't any yet. There aren't any yet. Sorry. Uh, the government aims to pass a hybrid bill through Parliament in 2015. This bill will contain powers to construct high speed two and make compulsory purchase orders. A hybrid bill is a public bill which affects a private interest a particular person or organisation. It's generally initiated by a government on behalf of a non-parliamentary body such as a railway company or a transport agency. And it's treated like a private bill at the beginning of its passage through Parliament. This gives individual bodies an opportunity to oppose a bill or seek its an amendment. But once it's passed, that's going through, you can only amend it. You can't uh, uh, chuck it out once it's passed and when you get to the select committee stating in both houses of Parliament. An example of the hybrid bill is the one they use to construct the channel tunnels. Compulsory purchase could begin as early as 2015, although this will occur later in the majority of cases. High speed 2 from London to Birmingham could be open in 2026. Statutory compensation for physical impact resulting from the railway, including noise, will become available in 2027. And the Y route of HS2 to Manchester and Leeds including a Heathrow Spur, could be open by 2033. What is the council doing? The London Borough of Hingham is part of a consortium along with 14 other local authorities who also object to proposal and they're known as the 51M group. The 51M coming from the 51 million pounds that this is predicted to cost from each and every parliamentary constituency in this country. And that's if they've got the figures right, we don't think they have. We're focused on putting together a strong and coordinated campaign to defeat government proposals, and we are in this until the end. The campaign includes political lobbying, media coverage, and developing our response to the consultation, working with other groups opposed to the scheme, and the relevant legal challenge. We submitted evidence to the Transport Committee, and we will submit our own response to the consultation. With our track record of defeating the third runway, we're providing a lot of experience to this campaign, and we'll come back to this later. The consultation questions. In the consultation on High Speed 2, the government asked seven questions and will form the basis for people's responses. There are some general points to remember when answering the questions. It's important when looking at these questions not to take them at face value. When making a response, you should think about what the question is asking in the context of the whole proposal. It's vital to remember that the best way to have your response taken seriously is to present a logical, informed, and well-reasoned argument against HS2. To avoid the tag of NIMBY, I would advise you to make sure that your response includes concerns about the whole of HS2 and not just the effect on you personally. This is very important. Please note the consultation runs until the 29th of July. All responses will count equally we're told. If you submit your response online, you can look back at any time until that deadline and add or amend your response. If you do respond online, there's a 2,000 character limit per question. Uh, there's no restriction, you can send your comments in a post. Seven questions that HS2 asks are very specific and they're loaded questions. So they're not in the spirit of genuine consultation. Of course, our answer is entirely up to you, but you may wish to consider following. Question one, do you agree that there is a strong case for enhancing the capacity and performance of Britain's intercity rail network to support economic growth over the coming decades? Not this one. This is a very heavily loaded question because hardly anybody could disagree with this statement. Clearly trains are becoming increasingly overcrowded at peak times and everybody would want better rail services. I would suggest that you point out that HS2 is not the answer to enhancing capacity and performance of intercity trains. HS2 could worsen the North-South divide, and at best it may just help Birmingham, Manchester and Leeds at the expense of other cities. 
You may also want to say that HS2 has already made its decision on the proposed route, but it's not consulting on any other alternatives, which means the consultation is flawed. Alternatives such as improving the existing railway network have not been properly evaluated, and these may provide greater and wider economic benefits than the current HS2 proposal. Two, do you agree that the National High Speed Rail Network from London to Birmingham, Leeds to Manchester, and Y Network will provide the best value for money solution, best balance of cost benefits, for enhancing railway capacity and performance? No, I would not agree with the Y Shape Network provides the best value for money. It costs £32 million and it will not be run until 2033. The benefits are based on a number of assumptions which do not have the best evidence to support. The other alternatives have not been properly costed out. It is likely that improvements to the existing rail network would provide better links to more towns, creating economic growth across more areas, and better benefiting more communities at a much lower cost than HS2 and much sooner than 2033. It would appear that the proposed route and the Y-shaped network have been heavily influenced by the assumption that there should be a link to Heathrow. This has been the reason this route has been pushed to the west rather than taking the more direct route northwards. But there is no evidence that the direct link to Heathrow is justified in terms of the business case or reducing carbon emissions. <coughs> Question three. Do you agree that the government's proposals for a phased rollout of the National High Speed Network and for links to Heathrow and the High Speed 19 the Channel Tunnel? No. The approach the government is taking is unacceptable. The government is consulting on the principle of the Y network without having looked at the details and the feasibility of the routes. This means that the people of Birmingham to Manchester and Leeds legs are not being properly informed of the impacts on their areas and therefore cannot respond now. However, once the consultation is closed, the principle of the Y-shaped route would have been decided, which means that the right to respond on the principle of the scheme would have lapsed. The government's approach of consulting in a two-phase approach is not allowing all residents and businesses to participate in a proper and joint up the two-phase approach to consultation could result in a London to Birmingham route being built, with no agreement or funding ever being secured for the balance of the Y network. There's no evidence to show that the government has properly investigated the impact of linking high speed to, to Heathrow or to Houston and St Pancras. With regard to Heathrow, this link would fuel more demands for flights and worse than carbon emissions. With regard to Houston, there would not be sufficient capacity to satisfy, satisfactorily disperse the large volume of passengers there. Four, do you agree with the principles and specification used by High Speed 2 Limited to underpin its proposals for high speed rail lines and the route selection process HS2 Limited undertook? No, the government should, not, should have consulted on a national policy for transport, including intercity rail services, roads, and airports. For example, there's a case for high speed services to the West Country and to Southampton and Portsmouth area. We do not believe that HS2 examined all reasonable options with regards to routes and specifications for the high speed network. Furthermore, I do not believe the specification used by high speed 2 is adequate. For example, the high speed specification for HS2 means that the route has too little flexibility and is causing unnecessary environmental and social damage. Also, I believe that HS2 took too much account of Heathrow and the West London interchange, and this made the route selection process unjustifiably skewed through West London at the expense of other more viable options. Question five, do you agree that the government's proposed route, including the approach proposed for mitigating its impacts, is the best option for a new high-speed rail line between London and the West Midlands? No, I don't believe that. The proposed route from London to the West Midlands represents the best cost option. I don't believe that. The benefits HS2 claim are not sufficient nor well dispersed across the country to justify the high cost in financial, environmental and social terms. Unfortunately, there is no convincing business case for HS2 to justify the environmental and social harm that this will cause. The government has not provided sufficient information with regard to mitigation to enable me to respond in a considered way. High Speed 2 will not be undertaking any detailed work on construction or noise mitigation until after the consultation is over. I cannot therefore answer this question on mitigation in any meaningful way. Question six, do you wish to comment on the appraisal of sustainability of the government's proposed route between London and the West Midlands that has been published to inform this consultation? The appraisal of sustainability has not been properly carried out or consulted on with regard to other alternatives 
but of improving the capacity of existing rail services. This approach therefore appears to be flawed. It's difficult to comment on the appraisal of sustainability because the level of information provided on the plans is difficult to interpret. For example, the maps on noise <coughs> do not show individual properties and therefore of little practical use for residents wishing to know how they will be affected. These details will be published at a later date after the decision on the route has been made. Seven, do you agree with the options set out to assist those whose properties lose a significant amount of value as a result of any new price decline? Your preferred option, as we've heard, will depend on your personal circumstances. For example, the exceptional hardship scheme would be best for those wanting to move soon. Property bond is likely best for those not wanting to move straight away, which is be transferred to new owners. The third option would suit those who don't want to move because they get some compensation for the impacts they would endure after the line is up and running. You should emphasise in your response that despite these discretionary measures, the right has already started and will continue for many years until the construction of HS2 starts. But apart from the very limited exceptional hardship scheme, the compensation will not be paid for many years. Make sure that you have your say. You've got until the 29th of July. These proposals have significant implications for this borough and your communities and your homes, so please make sure you respond. You have to register online and create a password if you use that route, and as I've said, this will allow you to revisit your response and add an amendment once you've written it. You can also uh, send in written responses by post. I think we've got the address somewhere on the screen. Okay then, to conclude, I said I would return to what Indian Council is doing about this scheme. We are taking the same approach to defeating the third online proposal. We've already committed £200,000 to the fighting fund to finance legal and technical advice as well as the publicity. We will commit further funding as required. The government will try to get this promoted as a done deal to take the fight out of those who oppose it. It's going to happen anyway, so what's the point of fighting? We heard this at various times right to the end of the third runway campaign. We kept our nerve and commitment Get focus on what's important and we want to know. Our people, our heritage, our environment. This is what we value as a council and we serve to protect those values. I can tell you tonight that I honestly believe that we will win this and whilst I'm leader of this council we will commit whatever time, resources or finances needed to do so for however long it takes. 